thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I because I love talking about the stuff that you see that great. Okay, when I first brought it, it was on this sort of really cool star field, and then we put it up here, and nobody could see it. So I, I went and did like a, a, a PowerPointy kind of thing. So. Uh, hopefully what's on the slides will be interesting to you. Um, but thank you for the invitation. And uh, I've known N Nancy now for several years. And just the work that, that she has done over the years with Kerr and now uh, NACNU is just it's really extraordinary. And so I love that I've been able to contribute some of my thoughts about my own processes to, uh, to share with you guys here in the room. So thank you very much. Now, she mentioned. Um, my title, and I don't know if you guys have seen this thing. Uh, it was in the Chronicle not too long ago, and I saw it, and I kind of had fun for about 20 minutes clicking on this thing. So you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Okay, because we have, we have a lot of administrators in the room. We have a lot of faculty members. So I just wanted to share with you some of the things that came up in the 20 minutes that I spent. Um, the Associate Assistant Provost for the Subcommittee on Neighborhood Relations. The Deputy Associate Dean of the Committee on Learning Diversity, the Assistant Coordinator of the Task Force on Athletic Planning, that's a good one, Principal Associate Dean of the Subcommittee for Dining Services, and Principal Associate Coordinator of the Committee on Invest Investor Outreach, that's important. What else we got? Lead Associate Provost for External Compliance to the Task Force on Donor Communications, <laughs> Associate Provost for Entrepreneurial Learning, Executive Associate President of the Subcommittee for the Strategic Neighborhood Outreach. Oh, wait a minute, that's my title. Yeah, so <laughs> it kind of looks like this title that I've been wrestling with over the last year could have actually been created by some sort of computer algorithm, right? Compared to all of these things that, uh, that you guys have been experiencing as, as far as the, um, the university and the way we're headed. And that is a really interesting conversation that's going on in academia, as you guys know, is, is different administrators sort of being very, very specialized on different things. And what is that all about? Um, the past year, I've spent a great deal um, not only, I guess, explaining my title, but kind of defending my existence, if you guys know what that means, right? And so I thought I would give you guys a little bit of a history lesson of, of, from, from me to kind of give you a sense of how I got here and also how I explain what I do to my colleagues as well as to my students because I still teach and I still teach every semester and that's important to me that I still maintain these, uh, these relationships with my own undergrads. Okay, so who am I? How did I get here? Entrepreneurship is totally a buzzword, right? How many of you have been talking about it on your campuses? Raise your hand. Yeah, see, look at that. Okay, entrepreneurship is totally a buzzword. Entrepreneurship is totally a business term, right? So why is a playwright standing in front of you <laughs> talking about entrepreneurship and having been dubbed with this title of Associate Provost for Entrepreneurial Lear uh, Learning. Now what happened is that my campus actually has a line item on the budget and our previous president came in and saw this line item and he said, we're not really doing anything with this. It looks really, really good to the legislature, right? They love seeing this kind of thing, but what exactly are we doing about it? And so this is kind of how I came to be. But it always comes down to this, right? Anytime I come and talk to people who are not affiliated with my institution, they're like, well, wait a minute, you're a theater artist, right? What are you doing teaching entrepreneurship? And so, I, I, yeah, I'm kind of teaching entrepreneurship, but mostly what we're doing is we're modeling it, and here's how. Whoops, I went backwards. Or am I? Am I teaching entrepreneurship? So you guys know what this is? Yeah, all right. So for those of you who don't know what this is, I'm a massive Doctor Who fan. We're going to get in the TARDIS, and we're going to go back to the year 1980, when the average income was $19,500. The average price of a house was $13,650. Do you guys remember this? <laughs> average tuition at a public university, this is my favorite one, $2,100, and average tuition at a private university, $9,500. Post-it notes are invented. Voyager 1 sends the first high-resolution images of Saturn back. Star Wars Episode 5, The Empire Strikes Back, opens. And this is my favorite. Gary Newman's Cars is the 12th most popular song. So if you guys know what that is, that's one of my favorites. I 
look like this. I had just turned 10 years old. Uh, some very significant things happened to me when I was 10 years old. First of all, my mother and I watched Carl Sagan's Cosmos when it was on PBS. Does anybody remember that? Several of you do. Okay, I remember sitting in front of this sort of massive television box we had with the dials that you could turn, and our PBS station was always really fuzzy, but that's okay, we watched it anyway. And I watched all 10 episodes with my mother. The second thing that happened was that my mother gave me an old telescope, and by old, I mean really old. Uh, this thing was this, this, uh, from probably from the 50s. It belonged to my uncle when he was a kid. and It had this sort of really rickety wooden tripod that was a part of it. And I took it outside into the backyard and I pointed it towards Jupiter and I think I saw it. <laughs> Still not sure, and I've since seen you know, images of Jupiter from, from better telescopes, but there was a blob on, <laughs> in the telescope and I was pretty excited about that blob. Uh, so excited that I spent the night outside with my sleeping bag and the telescope, and that was pretty cool. There was a big dog that came and woke me up, though, in the morning. That was not fun. And then the other thing that happened was I saw a performance of the third national tour of Annie in Indianapolis at Clues Hall. Now, you may wonder why these events were significant in my life, and they were significant because when I was a kid, I was very, very interested in two things. And I was told many things from the people who worked with me in school. So I was told by my biology professor that I should be a biologist. Not, not professor, this was teacher. Although he was a professor, he was awesome. He professed. Um, my, my biology teacher in high school that I should be a scientist. I was told by my chemistry teacher in high school that I should be a scientist. But I was also told by my English teacher in high school that I should be a writer and by my art teacher and my theater teacher, which I didn't really have a theater class the, um, in high school. My theater class were the, the 10 misfit kids who didn't get onto any athletic teams and they decided to get together and do something after school and that was our thespian troupe. Yeah, so I was told by our uh, high school thespian mentor that that's what I should do. So I was given all of these sort of conflicting thoughts in my head about what I wanted to be when I grew up. And as you know, when you get to your senior year of high school in this country, you are told that you need to know what you're gonna, what you're gonna do. You go to college, you pick a major, you spend four years, and then at the end of four years, you are all prepared to go and have a career in your major of choice. Is that right? <laughs> I heard a lot of what I thought I would, which is no, not at all. But we're, in, we're caught in this place between sort of the mythology of why you go to college, which is you go to college to get a job and get a career, which is what my father did, right? He went to college, studied engineering, got a career, and did it for 40 years before he retired. That's what a lot of our students expect when they go to college. And so I had to choose, I was told I had to choose, and like any good, precocious high school student, I decided to leave it to chance, which made my parents really, really happy. Not at all. <laughs> I picked my theater school, which was the University of Evansville, go Purple Aces. I know Dr. Dr. Kazee's not here anymore. Is anybody here from Evansville? No, okay, anyway, I talked to him earlier. Go Purple Aces. I auditioned for one theater school. Uh, my research told me that this was the school in Indiana that I really needed to go to, so I was terribly excited about it. And I got in, and I was really excited. But the other option was, okay, if I don't get into this one theater school, I'm gonna go to Purdue and I'm gonna study physics. So those were my two choices, <laughs> right? And I, if I don't get into theater, then I'm gonna go and do this. And I thought, well, that's a good way to navigate this very weird split personality that I had cultivated. But I got in. I got into University of Evansville, and I was very uh, excited to get in. And then I realized, uh, as I was sort of working on what my future was gonna look like as this precocious college freshman, once I committed to being a theater major, I thought, all right, well, I gotta take all of these other interests that I have and I got to put them aside because now is the time in my life to focus on this thing and what I'm going to do. So I fell into a bunch of rigid categories and I tried to fit myself into this predetermined identity and unfortunately um, this predetermined identity that I thought I had was actor. Now I'm going to go and I'm going to become rich and famous because 99% of theater majors 
go to college to become rich and famous. Yes, okay, everybody knows what I'm talking about. They go to become rich and famous. And then it's usually in that first year where they realize, oh wait a minute, this is work. Oh yeah, I gotta work hard, so I gotta do a little bit more than just jazz hands. And the people who enjoy doing theater are then brought out and then they realize, okay, this is a, something that takes a lot of work, a lot of dedication, and a lot of practice. And of course, less than 3% of people who choose to do theater make a living actually doing the thing that they set out to do. Well, fortunate for, fortunately for me, I get into my first acting class and about 20 minutes into my first acting class, I'm like, wait a minute, I don't like this. I don't like doing this. So I put all of my eggs in this basket and darn it, I'm determined, so I'm gonna figure it out. But luckily I had some mentors at the time who said, you know what, you can still do theater if you don't act because I was really, really bad at it. I mean, I was really bad. <laughs> And John David Luce, who was the director of the program at Evansville, who turned out to be a, a dear friend and mentor of mine now, um, told me when I went to his office and said, you know what, I don't like my acting class. He goes, you know what, that's great because you didn't get into Evansville because of your acting. You got in because of your grades. I didn't know what to do with that information. So <laughs> I decide to forge on and become something. I didn't know what it was at that point, but I was gonna do something. And I began thinking about all of these decisions and choices that I had made, and all of these things that I loved as I was growing up and becoming a kid, and I decided, okay, maybe I'll write. Because Nancy mentioned in the introduction, I had uh, um, 10, uh, at one point, I actually had 10 pen pals around the world. I wrote to somebody from Germany, and I wrote to a Marine who was stationed in Beirut at the time, and I just loved writing. So I thought, okay, maybe I will write plays. Maybe that's what I will do. And I was given this piece of writing advice, which I'm sure you know, or have heard before, that when you're a playwright, you write what you know, or when you're a writer, you write what you know, yeah? Which was the worst advice that I could have gotten as an 18-year-old. <laughs> I do see some nods, which is great. Uh, that was the worst advice I could have gotten as an 18 year old because I didn't know anything. What I did know was that I wrote this cute little play and it was about this, this you know, husband and wife and they were kind of funny with each other and so we did this little staging at Evansville and it was great. And so then I decided that because I'm a playwright, I'm going to go and write the, the best play ever written, the magnum opus, of, of late teens, early 20-something angst that lasts for three and a half hours, and I get back at all of my ex-boyfriends <laughs> and all of the people who said bad things about me in high school, and it was terrible. It was so bad. I still have this play. It's in a box in my attic. When I need a, a confidence boost, I take it out of the box and look through it and say, you know what, this is what I did. But that was the thing, that was how I interpreted write what you know, was write all of this angst that I'd been feeling as a teenager. And uh, I teach playwriting now, and I don't let my students write what they know. And I'll explain that in a minute, that's actually a very specific assignment. So I get through school and I discover directing for the theater because I'd had these experiences as a playwright where I was like, oh my gosh, I can't do this. This is just too hard, just too hard. So I started directing and I thought, all right, I'm a storyteller, maybe I'll do this. And it turned out I had a little bit of a knack for it. So I graduate and I do an internship and then I sell a bunch of stuff. I throw the rest in a truck and I move up to Chicago sight and scene. So this is most of my 20s in one PowerPoint slide. I got a job in a bookstore. I gathered a bunch of people together. I started a theater company. At some point in there, I met my husband. Hi. Uh, figured out how to incorporate this theater company, make it a nonprofit. I produced a bunch of productions. I marketed these productions. And in order to do that, I wrote press releases and I made cold calls to a bunch of people. Uh, created a performance series in my bookstore, which I loved, which we actually we used as fundraisers to fund the productions. Um, I grew the company, I negotiated artistic differences, had many, many arguments with many, many people, and then towards the end of this process, I kept hitting the wall over and over again. And I thought, okay, I've done all this work, now I'm a theater director, I'm running a company, it's awesome, I love Chicago, why am I not happy? And the theater work that I had been doing was just, you know, taking these plays, applying a couple of tricks to them, doing them in small storefront theaters all over Chicago, and they were fine. 
they were fine. Everybody had a good time. We got some pretty good reviews. Yay, raw. And I began looking at things thinking, OK, well, if this is going to be the rest of my life, I'm going to have to figure something out. Because hitting the wall over and over again is not really a great way to enter your 30s. So I decide it was time for grad school. And in grad school, a couple of things happened. University of Evansville gave me this am amazing practical education with this liberal arts base that showed me how to get into a room with people I didn't know and solve problems, right? And that was what I did. And at that time, then I began thinking, okay, well, what does it mean to be an artist? I can do all of this stuff and I can hit the ground running and I can collaborate with people, but what does it actually mean to make some art, right? And I didn't know the answers to those questions, which was my biggest uh, realization that it was time for me to go to graduate school. So I wound up at the University of Minnesota pursuing an MFA in directing, and a couple of things happened. One of my mentors, uh, Michal Kobielka, uh, who is a theater scholar, uh, told me this first thing where he said, the art of the theater is a quest to make the impossible possible. And that just blew my mind. This is the kid who, when she was 10 years old, was out in the backyard stargazing, imagining light years, and now somebody in theater is telling me that my job is to try and make the impossible possible? Game on, man! That's totally what I want to try and do. And then the next thing is he introduced me to historian Michel de Certeau, and this is one of my favorite quotes of all time, which is, identity freezes the gesture of thinking. And you can go on and read the rest, but what this means to me is that when you try and put yourself into this category, all of a sudden you stop thinking about what it is that you're doing, right? When you label yourself, I am a playwright, I am a historian, I am a chemist, if there is something outside or at the fringes of that discipline that interests you, sometimes you're not wanting to give yourself permission to go there. Right? And the fact of the matter is that our students who are coming to us now, as well as my guess, everybody in this room at some point in your careers, are interested, I mean seriously interested in something that could be labeled outside of your discipline. Right? So what happens when that occurs? This is also something that is important to me in my teaching, and I'll get, that to, I'll get to that in a second. But what grad school did for me was it opened the door to playwriting once again, even though I had put it on the shelf for 10 years, along with my love of science and physics, and physics especially, astrophysics. I put that all on the shelf, but now I have people telling me, don't write what you know, write what you want to know which was probably the biggest epiphany I had as a young artist. And I try and share this with my students now, that when you are a scholar, regardless of your discipline, you are on a quest for truth, you're on a quest for knowledge, you're on a quest for big questions, and you're on a quest to try and figure out what your corner of scholarship means to everyone else, right? And so I'm a storyteller, sure, but I am a storyteller that has very specific interests and goals, which are very interdisciplinary. So one of the things that became very clear to me, and I also read Snow's essay on the two cultures around this time, and I also saw it when I was in grad school for theater directing, I also knocked on the door of um, Michelle Janssen, who was teaching, uh, uh, actually he was teaching Einstein at University of Minnesota, and he opened the door and said, can I help you? And I said, I am a graduate student in theater, and I want to learn relativity. What do I do? And he said, well, you make an appointment with me, and we figure that out. And I did. And he wound up being one of my graduate thesis committee members <laughs> because we worked together on an independent study in relativity. I wrote a play about Einstein. He was my advisor. We also talked about issues of space and time within the theater space, which of course just blew my brain. And he handed me this essay and he goes, have you ever read this? And it was Snow's essay on the two cultures. And I said, well, I don't agree with any of this. And he goes, neither do I. And it turns out that one of the reasons why Michelle was so awesome with me is that his sister, he was actually from the Netherlands, and his sister actually runs a theater company in Amsterdam. So it was completely in his world as well. And that was one of the reasons why we hit it off. 
Despite the cultural differences, the processes that we undertake in the arts are the same. And this is probably one of the reasons why science always used to speak to me, because my favorite things to do as a kid was to work in the science labs, to actually get my hands dirty with a chemistry experiment, or do something in my physics class that was about motion or kinetic energy, right? I loved the science fair. I was one of those geeky students that would you know, love the sort of science aspect and the performative aspect of it as well. So we work in a lab. Artists ask questions and they test answers with audiences exactly like scientists do. And then we communicate our findings, either through writing in journals, presentations at conferences like this one, or theater performances. Right? We communicate those to our audiences and we give ourselves permission to ask questions. Artists do it, scientists do it. My theory is that all academics should do it. This resulted in me finally accepting <laughs> the title of playwright, the identity of playwright. Um, and I wrote these plays now um, that have had some pretty great success and I'm pretty proud of them and I'm working on my first film now. I actually got a chance to go to the Tribeca Film Festival, won a grant from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, which was my nirvana. Oh, I love Alfred P. Sloan Foundation and I get to spend a week at the Tribeca Film Festival working with um, producers. So hopefully Human Terrain will be out in a as a film within the next couple of years. Uh, fingers crossed. We're looking for financing right now and uh, things are hopefully going well. So. But here's the deal. So I've been doing this creatively now for the past decade, but I've also been teaching. And I have these really specific interests myself, creatively. I also have these very specific interests in teaching and how we're supposed to work with our students. And I love creating these multidisciplinary spaces, right? It's okay for me as a playwright to ask questions about science, but do we teach this way? And do we offer our students opportunities to do that? And the answer when I first started teaching was no. But I looked for as many opportunities as I could to make this happen. It turns out, now hopefully these are things that have come up in conversations at your institutions, but faculty now, we, we are in a box that was created in the 1950s. Right? And we work our way through our fields and we do very specific things in order to earn tenure and in order to get promotions. And because of that, it is very, very, very scary for a faculty member to stand up in front of their class if they get a question from a student and they don't know the answer. It's a scary proposition to stand there and say, I don't know. And that's especially true when you're dealing interdisciplinarily, right? If somebody is interested in writing a piece about Middle Eastern history and they ask you a very specific question, it's okay for you to say, I don't know. And in fact, it's expected, right? So it's okay for that. Fear of defying these traditional well-established hierarchy and standards of the classroom and of life. So it's me standing in front of a classroom, much as I'm standing in front of you guys now, saying, here are some things that you guys need to know, right? So as a teacher now, I look for opportunities to do that differently. You've all heard the cliche, the sage on the stage versus the guide on the side, right? That's what this is about. This is about giving students the opportunity to do their own discovering. It's about defying these identities, eschewing progress, and it's also fear of being a dilettante, right? So if I were to go and do a play about science or go and do a play about the Middle East, since that's not my field of study, I'm not allowed to do that. That's, a, that's kind of a scary proposition, right? And then fear of these boxes that I told you about. So my big question as an educator became this. How can I teach these ideas, not only by telling students what to do, but by modeling the behavior for my students? And this is what I came up with. So I have four examples now of these interdisciplinary projects that I've been able to do with my students, both in supportive uh, environments, meaning that we've had money and resources granted to us to do this, and also uh, resources that aren't as, or areas that aren't as supportive. So we've actually pulled together classes with hardly any funding whatsoever to see what we can do and how we can um, create pieces that exercise these, these fears. 
Um, I am now director of the Virginia Ball Center for Creative Inquiry, but as Nancy said in her introduction, one of my first opportunities was to get to do a fellowship there, and it is a very um, unusual program in that they buy you out of your department for an entire semester. So I got to work f uh, with 15 students for the equivalent of 15 credit hours on one project. Talk about a breath of fresh air. It was pretty extraordinary. The amazing thing about the Virginia Ball Center is that it's funded, it's an independent entity. So we're affiliated with Ball State, but we're funded by an outside organization. So we actually have the resources in place to do these kinds of really intense experiences with students. And despite the project, students talk about these as life-changing activities. So in my instance, I worked with this um, merry bunch of students, and this picture was not posed. It looks posed, it looks like, okay, everybody, look like you're being studious and look like you're thinking about important things. This was totally not posed. This was every day in our seminar. <laughs> and here we're actually looking at a series of animations that were created um, for, uh, by the students for our play. So this is the group. We wrote this thing together. So I gave everybody different assignments, and I said, okay, write a, write a scene about this, write a scene about this, write a scene about this. And then they would bring them in, and we would talk about not only the specific structure, dialogue, characters, et cetera, et cetera, but we would pull them together into little groups and talk about how they were similar, how they were different, and more specifically, the subject matter. We had a geneticist come in, who was a friend of mine on campus, come in and work with us for two solid weeks and give us a crash course in advanced genetics. And it was that specific. So it was all the stuff that we needed to know because we had stakes in this thing that we were creating. And those students were so engaged. We only had three science majors in the bunch. They were so engaged, all of them. Way more than if they were sitting in a room with 350 people uh, learning Biology 100, right? So it was a really exciting experience science-wise. This is the reading, this is not the reading in DC, this is the first reading we did at uh, Indiana Repertory Theater, which was really exciting. We had about 300 people show up to that. And then after that, we took it to Washington, which was awesome. The best thing about that entire experience was we were terrified. These students were terrified. They said, what do you mean this is an audience of about 200 people who do science for a living? I said, that's exactly what it is. And the students were terrified. I don't know if you know this. But they, they got up and they did the reading. And then afterwards, these kids were treated like rock stars. And that was the best experience for them ever. Like they're talking to career scientists about how did you get this right? And the student was like, we did our research. We did our homework. And it was just this win-win situation. The students felt very vindicated in the work that they had done. And the scientists were like, wow, we really saw our stories on stage. And that was exciting for both of them, right? So after this whole experience, I was hooked. This is Mephistopheles. He was a magician. And uh, this was a picture from Ball State University's full production of the Human Faustus Project. Uh, the next time I did this, uh, I was so excited that I decided I was going to scrape together a bunch of people uh, with very little funding and do this again. And we wrote a play called Daughters of Trinity. And this play is actually about um, four women who uh, worked on the Manhattan Project. And the first question is always, what do you mean women worked on the Manhattan Project? I was like, yeah, there were a lot of women who worked on the Manhattan Project. We researched probably, uh, yeah, we researched 40 of them. Uh, we had the two main authors and scholars in this area show up um, with us, uh, Carolyn Hertzenberg and Ruth Howes, two physicists who came and actually spent a week with us and talked about their research. And then we wrote a play focusing on four of these. And that play was done at the Playwright Center in Minneapolis. And then Ball State University also did it uh, in a production. And I've just actually received an offer last week to rework this play with a company in Chicago. So I'm going to see how that's going to look. Um, but it's really exciting. And this is Ruth and Carolyn. And this is my merry bunch of people. And you can see there's like, um, uh, we have post-it notes with all of the different physicists behind us and relationships and everything. It was a wonderful summer. And this is the production at Ball State University. Um, what the students created, uh, the woman in, this, in the front is actually um, a young child in the script of about 10 years, she's about 10 years old, but of course this is Kate and she was in college when she played this. Um, but this character is the bomb. And so the atomic bomb actually appears in the play as a small child and asks questions about her mother's 
about her creators. And that's how we learn the physics behind this whole thing. And that was the student's creation. And it's fabulous. Uh, did it again, now using ethnography and sociology. And this was also a small project that I did over the summer. But I partnered with a sociologist colleague of mine, Melinda Messenio, who is a genius. And we actually pulled together half theater students and half sociology students. And what we did for this project was that my theater students took Melinda's class in advanced ethnography, which was a 400 level sociology class, and had to do everything that those students did. And then Melinda's students took my playwriting class. And together, we created the Middletown Theater Project, which was actually based on ethnography that the students themselves did in Muncie, Indiana. And then we pulled these stories together, and we wrote a play that juxtaposed 1920s Muncie with current Muncie and some of the different aspects that, these, that the people who live there uh, were experiencing. And so that was a, an, an example of interdisciplinarity where we actually applied the processes of the two disciplines together. Uh, I don't have a picture of that bunch, but uh, I do have a picture of our <laughs> Marquis of Muncie Civic. And then the last time I did this was another Virginia Ball Center project. This was just a couple of years ago. And word has gotten out about some of these projects that Ball State has been able to do. And this was a commission from the Brown County Playhouse in Brown County, Indiana, which is Nashville, Indiana. There's a real history connected with um, this particular part of Indiana. And so I gathered students together. And this time we wrote a musical. And not all of these students played musical instruments, but I made them do it anyway. So I have this wonderful video of all of these students in the lobby area of the Virginia Ball Center all playing instruments that they don't know how to play. And you think it would be awful, and it's really not. It's actually kind of bizarrely interesting. So we wound up focusing on, yeah, this is that group. <laughs> we wound up focusing on this guy, Frank Hohenberger, who was a photographer who actually did his own sort of not exactly ethnography, but um, he did his own sort of research in the 1920s into the citizens of Nashville and wrote a column for the Indianapolis Star. So he was our main character, and all of the different uh, people that were featured in his columns then emerged and became characters in the movie. So this is how I teach regardless of whether I'm teaching a normal class, we always do a collaborative experiment, and I always require students to bring in outside research. Even in just a normal, good old-fashioned playwriting class worth three hours, we always try and do this. And in every project I've ever led, and in every class I've ever taught, we have gone through this, and this is one of my favorites. <laughs> One of my favorite memes. Um, there's also a version of this where the language isn't as nice, but you know, I use this one. Um, and this is it. But it doesn't matter if you are a scientist in the lab or a playwright in his or her office or a bunch of theater students trying to put on a play, this is what you go through, right? This is the process of making things, whether it's knowledge, whether it's an article, or whether it's a play. Yeah? And this fundamentally is where the arts meets the humanities, meets the sciences. And all of this categorization that we're doing in our worlds right now, where we're going to give money, but we're only going to give it to STEM people, right? Or we're going to support certain majors, but only these, because philosophy isn't going to get me a job, right? This is where we're going to run into serious trouble moving forward, is the more we harden the categories of higher ed, the more we're going to get people who can't be in a room or collaborate or think critically or think creatively about the work they're doing regardless of what it is. Right? That's what the liberal arts does for us. And it allows us to pull all of these things together into the building of a life. OK, so teaching for me is about cultivating these things, how to recognize opportunities, how to be flexible, how to adapt to circumstances, how to, how to create opportunities for students to be both creative and innovative in the work that they're doing. They are initiative. They, they, are, um, they provide initiative. They provide their own self-direction. They can communicate and collaborate with each other. They, think, they can think critically, and they can problem solve. They can have a capacity for negotiating the best possible choice 
They can persuade other people to take their point of view, and they take risks. And this is what we call the entrepreneurial mindset. I told you I would come back to that title. That's what this is, right? So when I began researching what it means to be entrepreneurial, not an entrepreneur necessarily, but entrepreneurial, I began to seriously embrace this title that has been bestowed upon me. Because what does that mean? Well, it means teaching students and providing them opportunities to explore and exercise this mindset. It means that you as a teacher can say, I don't know in front of your students and you'll find out together. It means that teaching and learning is not about things because for crying out loud, we can Google it, right? but it's about how we use those things, how we process what we find out and make things. And these identities that I was talking about, these interdisciplinary silos, they're static, they're frozen, but what we do as scholars and as teachers, as educators, the questioning and the thinking and the exploring are not static and they don't have to be. So it's okay to say, I don't know, and go outside of your comfort zone. And so as a teacher moving forward, and also now as an administrator, and I do this in, in uh, administrative meetings and sometimes people get really annoyed at me, um, but I think that the thing that I can do for them most is show them my humanity. And that I'm in this because I'm a lifelong learner and I want to know things. And even though I have this job and it's a job and I get a paycheck and all of that, that the whole reason I am here is because I want my work to have stakes, and I want to be thinking, much as they are only several decades behind me. So we do it together in the classroom. For me, science and the arts are connected because there's always an audience. There's always a tension between what you do and how you talk about what you do, which is the process and the product that even in what we think of as a solitary laboratory experiment, you're still collaborating. You're still talking to people who are in the room with you. You are still working as a group. The intellectual process is not neat and tidy, it's messy. You have many roads that you go down that don't lead to anything and then you have other roads where you never thought would lead to something that turn out to be the biggest truth you've ever thought. It's okay to be passionate it's okay to be loud, to say you don't know, and embrace what you're doing. The arts, on the other hand, my fabulous students who are creative and think that, oh, I'll draw this thing and I'll put it up there and it's art. Arbitrary doesn't get you very far. And you do have a responsibility and there are consequences to what you say. I think all undergraduates can learn this, don't you think? Especially when you look at social media. <laughs> <laughs> there are consequences, my friends. Research and context is the key to every choice that an artist makes. Nothing is arbitrary. And if you know that what you're doing in the artistic context is the best choice, then you have to prove it to me. Much as a scientist would in her laboratory. Again, there's a tension between process and product, always and forever. And artistic processes, like scientific processes, are messy. And that's okay. We learn from the other, from each other, that we are not categories. Thinking is a gesture, it's never fixed. We are all storytellers, regardless of our field. Not knowing can be as powerful as knowing something. Writing what you want to know also means doing what you want to know. And that the world can be your laboratory. Thank you very much. I do have time for a few questions if people want. Yeah, we might be pushing it. Yeah, we have probably time for two or three questions. Sure. This is always the time. Hi. Hi. How did I become a professor? I ended up at Ball State teaching um, because the job that I had uh, was uh, going to lay me off. <laughs> um, actually, I had wanted to get into teaching ever since grad school because I was, since I was older, 
uh, when I went to grad school, I was in my late 20s, um, they gave me a teaching assistantship, which was not a typical part of that program, but they needed somebody, and so I stepped into it, and I fell in love with it. And it was actually um, the perfect class for me because it was acting for non-majors. So I was working with science people, I was working with business people, I was working with all sorts of majors, and to this day, I will never forget this. One of the most amazing things that has happened to me artistically was I gave this assignment, it was the first week of this class, and I was like, all right, well, these people are taking an acting class, and yet they've never had to do this before, and many of them can't even walk and talk at the same time, so how are we gonna do this? So I had them bring in a piece of text that they had memorized, and then I had them bring in an activity that they wanted to do while they were saying this piece of text, right? So they could get used to that sort of mind-body connection. And a business major came in, quietest student I'd ever known, came in with a deck of cards and he sets up a table and he starts reciting the preamble to the Declaration of Independence and then going into the Constitution. And he's creating a house of cards while he does this. And then when the house of cards falls down, he starts over. And by the end of that, this entire class was on the edge of their seats. And they were like, is he gonna do it? Is he gonna, is he gonna get to the next line? Oh, man. So it was the perfect exercise in everything that we go to the theater for. The whole suspense, the idea, the story, all of it was right there. And I got so excited, and I don't think this kid knew what to do with me. <laughs> afterwards but I actually wound up meeting him uh, I actually met him at uh, it was a total by chance thing I was going to a conference in Indianapolis and this guy was the foreman of a construction crew and he stops me on the street I was getting ready to go into Indiana Repertory Theater and he says you don't remember me but I was in your acting class and I looked at him and I said oh yeah I remember you you did the thing with the deck of cards and he goes yeah that class changed my life so uh, from there that was sort of one of those things that I really, really <laughs> knew that I wanted to do. So, and I got lucky. I totally got lucky. Um, the job that I wound up getting at Ball State was a perfect combination of things that I had done at that point, which was some management, because I had run a theater company, as well as um, taught some stuff in graduate school. So it was the right place at the right time. And the campus was also going through a beautiful um, uh, transformation in a lot of the stuff that I was talking to you about in this in this talk today so I kind of fit and it was great Julia, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so I'm interested you're you're trying oh, you're, <laughs> you're working to um, bring together two worlds that don't always see each other as related yes um, do you find one of where's the cell the hardest the sell the hardest right now is one of the reasons why I'm in the job that I'm in. Um, the sell, the most difficult sell is administratively because we've got all of these um, things that we have to do, all of these boxes that we have to check off. So credit hours. Um, this type of degree requires these classes and yet if somebody is chosen to participate in an immersive interdisciplinary seminar, how is this not going to interrupt their progress toward degree, right? Those are the biggest hurdles I have right now. And luckily, because I have some experience kind of being creative in this world of trying to make this, this happen, um, I have some allies on campus that allow us to kind of stretch and manipulate and do some things um, creatively with schedules, FTEs, credit hours, and all of that, that we may not be able to do. The difficulty, though, is we can only do that so much. And right now, the campus wants to do this work as a much more regular thing, right? So departments are gonna offer, offer these opportunities. Um, not only the Virginia Ball Center, but other sort of colleges will do things together or across the colleges. And yet, when we begin to set these things up, there's just roadblock after roadblock after roadblock. You know, do we buy the, the, the professor out of their class? How do we deal with credits? So those are the biggest hindrances, I think. And I, I you know, it's, it's, there was an article uh, in the Chronicle not too long ago, I think it was actually a couple days ago, where they were talking about the difference between revolutionary change versus incremental change, right? And that's kind of where my head is right now. Because of who I am and the work I've been lucky enough to do in my career, 
I enjoy this concept of big change and revolutionary change. And why don't we just scrap our entire core curriculum and start from scratch? You just can't do that. I mean, as much as I'd like to, <laughs> there's a couple of committees that would have my head. So then that becomes the conversation that we're trying to have, right? Is there, is there something that we can do that is a, that's not a Band-Aid, right? but can foster some of these bigger changes or pave the way for some of these bigger changes that we are all going to need to do, regardless of the size of our campuses, we're gonna need to do this. We're being required to justify ourselves in higher ed at a level we've not been required to do before. And we're being scrutinized by parents and by legislators and funders and foundation presidents and all of these uh, people are looking to us to justify what we're doing. So those are some of the more difficult things. 